Well, this morning we will be looking into the topic of marriage based out of Matthew chapter 19. And because of the contour of Matthew 19, 1 through 9, uh, we will endeavor to study and understand the Bible's teaching, not just about marriage, but also about divorce and remarriage. And it's my hope that these coming sermons are going to be helpful and instructive and comforting for you. And also for maybe some of you, they might also be convicting if necessary. But as we're going to see, blessed, uh, marriage is a blessed institution. It is created and ordained by God himself for our earthly good and his heavenly glory. However, marriage has fallen on hard times. It has become the subject of unceasing attacks over the last half century or so. And here's how this works. If you want to destroy a society, you must corrupt at least five things if you want to destroy a society. You must first corrupt law and government. Second, you must corrupt education. Thirdly, you must corrupt religion. Fourthly, you must corrupt the family. And fifthly, you must also corrupt the individual conscience. And it's not hard to see that the armies of hell are waging war on all five fronts right now. Now, with regard to the war on the family, however, the central element of the family is the marriage of the husband and wife. You can't have family, the the whole process of creating and growing a family without marriage. And boy, that has certainly taken a beating lately. It began really in the 1960s with the popularizing and destigmatizing of sexual promiscuity. Free love became the slogan of the 60s. And then by the 1970s, it was the advent of the no-fault divorce, whereby people could terminate their marriage covenant for any reason whatsoever without having to prove any kind of grounds. Fast forward 20 more years, and now you see not only the proliferation of divorce, but also the perversion of marriage. This is only further essentially codified into law in 2015 with the Obergefell ruling, which legalized universally so-called homosexual marriage. But it's even gone farther now with polygamous and polyamorous marriages and the like, and who knows what they're going to come up with next. And the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ has been raising her voice to protest all of this with the result that we are called bigots and haters and hypocrites. Well, why hypocrites? Well, because we're always told, and I'm sure you've heard this many times, well, the divorce rate inside the church is the same as it is outside the church. It's no different. And so the divorce rate being 50%, half of you are going to get divorced anyway. But that is actually a myth. It's not true. According to a recent census, so the the United States census, 72% of married people are still married to their first spouse. 72%. However, of the remaining 28%, they're either divorced or widowed, and the widowed make up about 8% of that. So the more recent estimates, the divorce rate is really down to about 20 to 25% in this country right now. What about the statement that the church gets divorced at the same rate as the world? In a 2014 book, The Good News About Marriage, researcher Shanti Fellin uh, reported that the divorce rate for the church, for church goers, church attenders, is 25 to 50 percent lower than the general unchurched population. And so that puts the number within the church at 10 to 15 percent, not 50. And even as I was reading some other books about the marriage stats this week, I was reading one. Uh, one writer who was saying in his 50 years of church-going experience, and then he just gave an autobiographical, he said, I tend to believe it's closer to like 5%, and maybe in some churches as low as 1%. That's just, that's not a stat, that's just his opinion. But basically, uh, the church, the divorce rate for the church is far lower than the world. Well, why is that? Why is the divorce rate lower for the church? I think there's lots of reasons, but one thing I tend to believe is because Christians who have been instructed by the word of God begin to learn to love and value God's institution of marriage. And we seek to honor him with our most sacred of relationships. In short, because we reflect the heart of Christ. And what is the heart of Christ regarding marriage? Well, that's what we're going to look at today. So turn your copy of Scripture to the Gospel of Matthew, 
chapter 19. We begin a new chapter today. I always love beginning a new chapter. Even though there's no chapter divisions in the original text, I just, it seems to be this fresh new Monday morning, doesn't it? Matthew 19. But Matthew 19 really does begin a new section of the gospel as the events of chapters 19 and 20 really bring us closer and closer to the cross, which is going to come in chapters to come. At this point, most of Jesus' ministry has been taking place in the northern region of Galilee. If you were to look at a map of Israel, the northern region is Galilee, the middle region is Samaria, the lower region is Judea. Most of his ministry has been in the north in Galilee, and he does make sporadic trips to Samaria and to Judea a few times a year. But now, he's going to begin to travel south, and ultimately, he's going to move all the way to the south to be eventually killed on the cross in Jerusalem. Now, he's been planning this all along. In fact, back in Matthew 16, 21, Jesus has been telling the disciples that he's going to go to Jerusalem, he's going to suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, he's going to be killed, and he's going to be raised up on the third day. He's been telling them this for quite some time now. And so chapter 19 begins that journey south to complete the mission of salvation, Jesus has come into the world to save sinners. That's why he came, that's why he died, that's why he rose. That's why he intercedes even now for the church. William Hendrickson, who's this New Testament scholar, notes that the events of chapters 19 and 20 likely occur between December of AD 29 and April of AD 30, which is April's the month of Passover. So these chapters, these two chapters here fall in a very short span of only a few months and even these events that we're going to be looking at today only cover over a small amount of days and weeks. But as he's traveling south, no doubt, the excitement from the crowds begins to grow along with the hatred from the Jewish leaders. And so Matthew chapter 19 begins with a tense interaction between the Lord and some of the Pharisees that sets the tone for all of the events to follow. And it's over the issue of marriage and divorce. And so Matthew chapter 19, we're going to look at just the first nine verses. Uh, We're going to read the first nine verses. We won't cover it all today, but let's look at chapter 19. When Jesus had finished these words, he departed from Galilee and came into the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him and asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. And they said to him, why then did Moses command her or to, to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? He said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. We'll stop right there. Now, in verses 1 and 2, they function sort of as a transition between the extended teaching on uh, reconciliation and restoration in Matthew chapter 18, and we spent several months on Matthew chapter 18, and and hopefully all of you are walking away and sort of moving on in your life with a, a good understanding of what these verses in Matthew 18 teach us. And so Jesus is moving on from that, and he's traveling south, and he, it, it, this is going to start to include this opposition. Verse 1 begins, when Jesus had finished these words, and so Matthew 18 is when he leads off, and right after Matthew 18, he immediately leaves the region of Galilee and starts to head south to Judea. Many scholars believe that the region beyond the Jordan, as they say, is the area known as Perea, which is near the city of Jericho. If you look on the map, it's right there. And this is only perhaps about 18 or 20 miles from Jerusalem, so it's very close to the main city. And he arrives there. We read in in verse 2, it says, as he's arriving, a large crowd followed him, and he healed them there. Now, at first glance, it may seem like this is just generic historical information, 
I saw, sometimes when we read our Bibles, we read verses like that, and we're like, well, that's nice to know, and we kind of just keep on moving. But I really believe that verse 2 may give us some insight into what's happening in verse 3. I think verse 2 is very valuable for that reason. See, as Jesus' popularity is increasing, so was the jealousy and the malice of the Pharisees and scribes. So he becomes more and more popular, more and more well-loved, and they become angrier and more bitter as that progresses. Because they know he's a threat to them, to their power, to their position. And so they're racking their brains trying to figure out how to get rid of him. And as early as Matthew 12, 14, we learn that the Pharisees had already been conspiring against him as to how they might destroy him. So they're trying to figure it out. They've been spending at this point at least a year working on a plan, hatching a plan to get rid of Jesus. Because here's the problem. They know they can't kill him because he's too popular at this point. He's way too popular. If they did that, if they, if they hung him out to dry, if they killed him, they would face immense retaliation because, again, he's going from town to town healing everybody. So the masses at this point in the gospel are with him. And so their plan is something a little bit more sinister. I shouldn't say as more sinister than murder, but more, uh, more sneaky their plan is to try to discredit him in the eyes of the people, and if they could do that, then the crowds would stop following him altogether, and then he would simply just go away. That's their goal, just go away. And so the gospel record shows us attempt after attempt to undermine him, to confound him, to discredit him, and to humiliate Jesus publicly. That's their goal. And verse 3 tells us that some of the Pharisees, they came to him, and what was the purpose? The verse says, to test him. They were coming for the explicit purpose of testing him. This wasn't an earnest inquiry, by the way. This wasn't curiosity, mere curiosity. Rather, this was a deliberate attempt to try to trip him up and to do so in front of this large crowd that we know has been following him since verse 2. So the verse 2 talks about this massive crowd, and by verse 3, they're standing in front of this massive crowd, and they want him to be completely humiliated in front of them. And how will they discredit him? Well, here's, what, here's the, the depth of their depravity. First, they're going to hang him on the horns of this contentious debate over divorce. We read about this in verse 3. Some Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him and asking, and here's where they're going to hang him on this. Is it lawful, to go to the law here, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? Now, I want to pause right here. There were several schools of rabbinic thought in Jesus' day, but there were two that were the most prominent. And I actually listened back to my message back in chapter 5, because I forget what I preach from week to week, so I have to go back and listen to my own sermon sometimes. But I remember talking about this in Matthew 5, that there were four main schools of thought, but really two that were the most prominent. And I still agree with that sentiment, by the way, from three years ago. So two main schools of thought here. One school of thought was based on the teaching from a rabbi named Shammai, who was more conservative and more traditional in his uh, interpretation of the, the, the Bible. Another school of thought followed a different rabbi named Hillel, who was more liberal in his view and more progressive. And these two main schools of thought, they debated all kinds of topics of the day, but none was perhaps more emotionally charged than this issue of divorce. And truthfully, the source of their debate really came down to the interpretation of one Old Testament verse, and that verse was Deuteronomy 24.1. In Deuteronomy 24, we find the provision, and Jesus makes reference to it, the provision given by Moses for a husband to legally divorce his wife. And I'm just going to read the verse to you. This is from the New American Standard. Um, Deuteronomy 24.1 says this, When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out from his house. And the law goes on from there, but that's the, the basics of where this is coming from. In the original Hebrew, it can be rendered a few different ways. The key phrase here in Deuteronomy 24.1 is the Hebrew phrase, erwat debar. And what that has been rendered as in many translations is this, a matter of indecency or a cause 
of immorality. In the New American Standard, it's rendered some indecency. So you can see there's some loose translations there. The idea being that if a Hebrew man found some kind of cause of immorality or a matter of indecency with his wife, he could then hand her a legal certificate of divorce and then go and find another wife. And the more traditional school of Shammai maintained that this cause of indecency pertained to some kind of sexual immorality or indecent exposure or nudity or something like that, public nudity, or possibly even adultery. And I say it that way because there was a more strict law dealing with adultery in Deuteronomy 22, 22. So Bible scholars say, well, he's probably not referring to adultery because that was a more serious offense. This is something a little less than that, some kind of immorality or indecency where she doesn't find favor in his eyes anymore. So Shammai maintained that the only cause you could, you could find for divorce here was some sexual immorality or indecency. That was the grounds that could, you could give her a legal divorce. But the school of Hillel, the more liberal school, read the verse a little bit differently. They broke up the phrase into two main parts. They cited the indecency as being one ground, but they also cited some other cause of indecency as a different ground. So they read the phrase this, not a cause of immorality, but a cause or immorality. That's how they saw it. And so this gave birth to what was known as the any cause divorce. In the first century, this is a first century Hillelite version of the no fault divorce. And the school of Hillel maintained that if a man found any cause, any cause of indecency, anything that was not pleasing in his own eyes, that was considered to be indecent. He could legally go and divorce his wife. And it's interesting because we have, through the course of biblical history and antiquity, we have many, many documented cases from the first early centuries of any cause divorces. Here are some of the examples of what men were granted for divorce from their wife. Their wife committed bad behavior, speaking too loudly so the neighbors could hear them, letting her hair down in public, Speaking ill of her mother-in-law, that's legit, I think, though, right? <laughs> Speaking ill of her mother-in-law, one man was granted divorce for that. Uh, burning or ruining dinner. Losing her looks or infertility. And so these were just some of the examples. So in these men's, these Hebrew men's eyes, well, yes, this is a cause of indecency. I can't handle this anymore. They'd go to the court. They would obtain a certificate. He'd go home and hand it to her and say, I'm sorry, we're done here. She'd move out and he'd find someone most likely younger and prettier, and that was what he would do. As you can imagine, this teaching became very popular for Jewish men who desired to find younger and prettier wives every couple of years. But all this was was serialized divorce over and over again and immorality. And so Jesus is posed with the question. The Pharisees, they, they throw this in his lap and try to force him to give his thoughts on the Hillelite view of divorce. Now, here's the thing. They know he doesn't adhere to that view. How do they know? Well, because he said as much back in Matthew chapter 5. This has already been popularized. They already knew what he believed about this. So they came to him knowing full well that he did not hold that view, that you could divorce your wife for any reason at all, and so their plan here is this. They're going to back him into a corner, get him to admit publicly to all this massive crowd. Now, we're outside Jerusalem now, so it's probably a larger crowd, a city crowd, probably a more progressive crowd. He's going to admit to all these large groups of people that he does not hold to this any cause divorce. It's going to make the crowd angry and upset because of this. And then once everybody in the crowd is stirred up into a frenzy, they're going to drop Deuteronomy 24, 1 on him and set him up so that he looks like he's working against the law of Moses. And once he has been proved to be working against Moses, he's going to be rendered disqualified in the eyes of this large crowd. And their thought is this, that's going to do the trick. They're going to be angry with him because they don't like what he has to say. And then we can prove that he has no authority whatsoever. Because they say, well, doesn't Moses give us the right to do this? That's going to be their plan later on. But for right now, 
They're just ready to spring their trap. And so verse three, some Pharisees come to him, testing him and asking, is it lawful? You see where this is already starting up here? They're gonna set up against the law. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? They just put it out and let it hang. And they, they sit back, what is he gonna do with this? We got him, that's what they're thinking, we got him. No matter what Jesus says, he is totally stuck. No matter how he answers this, the crowd's gonna be divided. If he says, yes, I totally agree with that, all the conservatives in the law, the law-abiding Jewish traditionalists, they're gonna, be, they're gonna flip right out. And they're gonna say, you haven't been saying this at all, this, you said something different a couple months ago. But if he says, no, I hold to the traditional position, all these other people who have divorced their wives, some of them countless times, are going to fly into a rage. So he, there's nothing he can do. He's totally stuck because this is a very personal issue. This is not some theoretical, philosophical, sort of out there question. It was contentious back then. It's contentious today. As soon as you begin to meddle into people's personal marital affairs and into their bedroom, people get very angry, don't they? No different here. Jesus would have faced the same exact thing that we are all facing in this culture today. So which is it? Is it the school of Shammai or is it the school of Hillel? So what do you say, Jesus? Which one is it? Verse four. He answered and said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, or what therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. I want you to notice what Jesus does here. He does not answer their question. In fact, he changes the discussion completely. And if you read the, the Gospels, he does this all the time. He never gets stuck into people's questions. He just changes the game. Sometimes I think that as Christians, we feel like we have to give culture an answer, that somehow the Bible's on trial, that somehow we're on trial. We're not on trial. The Bible's not on trial. God never has to defend himself. He's God, and we belong to him. And so Jesus here, he doesn't talk about divorce. He doesn't even get into it right here. Instead, he talks about marriage. He says in verse four, he answered and said, have you not read? This is insulting to their enlarged egos, isn't it? He's talking to the most theologically and biblically astute men in all of Israel. And essentially, he says, have you guys not read your Bible? I mean, this is, that's really insulting, isn't it? Because this is setting them back on their heels for a second. Well, what do you mean have we not read our Bible? We just came to you with a Bible verse. What are you thinking? He's essentially saying, have you not read your Bible? I'm not going to answer Rabbi Shammai, and I'm not going to answer Rabbi Hillel. Instead, I'm going to bring you an answer from the Word of God. Have you not read your Bible? It's very clear. Verse 4. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Now, Jesus is going to beat them at their own game here. See, he knows that they're going to take him to Deuteronomy 24.1 because that's the powder keg text. That's the, he knows that's where they're going. But he also understands Jewish hermeneutics. This is very interesting. I learned this this week. This is very interesting. There was a rabbinic principle of hermeneutics, biblical interpretation, that states this, the more original, the weightier. The more original, the weightier. In other words, the further back you go into the Bible toward the beginning, in your position, the more authority you could draw from. So they weren't drawing from Hillel or Shammai. They weren't gonna get their authority from that. They weren't gonna get it from the other parts of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. They went all the way into the Torah, into Deuteronomy. So they're thinking, okay, we're working from Torah here. He's going to have to deal with this issue. And so they think that they have him beat. But where does he go? He doesn't answer them from Deuteronomy. Where does he answer from? He goes back to Genesis. So he goes all the way back to Genesis, but not just to Genesis. He goes to the creation account. He's going to defend marriage from the creation account. This is very cool. I get excited. I don't know. You're excited, right? And this is even cooler. He goes back to Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. 
from the beginning. And they're thinking to themselves, from the beginning? What are you talking about? We've got to go to Deuteronomy to find about marriage. Jesus says, no, you don't. From the beginning, verse 1, 1. Then he continues, he who created them, he is referring to God the Father, the creator of all things. And who's the them? Adam and Eve, the parents of all humanity. And he quotes Genesis 1, 27, that God made humans male and female. See, Jesus is going to argue that his marital position comes from the creation account And he notes that when God created humanity, he created two sexes, male and female. And how many of each did he start with? He started with one man and one woman. And he created them biologically to go together, right? We read about this in in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, that Adam, before he had Eve, did not have a helper, a counterpart that was suitable for him. He couldn't go and have a relationship like this with any of the animals around. That's not natural either, right? So God creates a woman and brings him to, or brings her to him and brings them together in marriage. And if you read Genesis, the end of Genesis chapter one, and you read Genesis chapter, actually, end of chapter two, the end of chapter two functions and reads like a marriage ceremony where the father comes and brings the woman to the man. And he makes a profession of love for her. And then God joins them together as one flesh, right? And so we see that all the way back from the beginning, this is God's design. And you hear people today often try to uh, refute their traditional view of marriage and sexuality by arguing that, well, since Jesus never talks about any of these modern things that we're talking about, then he's okay with whatever we do. Jesus never talked about homosexuality. He never talked about transgenderism. Wrong. Absolutely wrong. You know why? Because even here, Jesus is affirming monogamous, heterosexual marriage. One man, only one man, and one woman. And for those also keeping score, he destroys the modern myth about 37 genders. 127, right? God made them male and female. So he goes all the way back to Genesis 1 to say all this stuff that we're seeing then and now. And by the way, this whole progressive ideology that we're seeing in flux right now, this is not new. Learn about old second century Gnosticism. It's the same stuff. Satan has nothing new to work with. All he does is recycle the same heresies over and over and over again. And so if you learn about all of the issues back of the first and second and third century, you know what to do about all this today. And so God created one male to go together with one female. That's his design. And so marriage is as old as creation because men and women were created for each other. That's why Jesus cites Genesis 2.24. And look at verse 5. It's quoted in verse 5 here. He says, God made them from the beginning, male and female, and then essentially God said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And the phrase, for this reason, that refers to the whole reason why men and women are even to be married at all. This is God's design. God's design is that a man shall leave his father and mother. That's the most sacred relationship that he has especially in Jesus' day. In that culture, family was very strong. Oftentimes, you would actually stay on the family property. Your, your father's house, you would just add on to his house and live there. And you would add your aunts and your uncles, and you'd have these massive compounds where the whole family would stay intergenerationally. So to leave your father and mother was to essentially leave your family completely. But that was the design, that you're to leave your father and mother, and then he is to be joined to his wife. The word joined here is also translated in Old English as cleaved. It meant literally to be glued or cemented together. So God's design is that a man leaves the loving fellowship of his own family and glue himself to a wife. And when this happens, This new entity, this new creation is created and it says, the Bible says, the two shall become one flesh. And then he adds this at the beginning of verse six. So, he's summarizing, so they are no longer two, 
but they are actually one flesh. Now, this is the creation of what we know to be the one flesh union. Now, certainly there is a physical component to the one flesh union as expressed through physical intimacy. We, and I'm not going to get into the details here. We all know what this is. But a husband and a wife, they come together physically, intimately. They become one physically through the act of consummating their marriage. But we know that a one flesh union is even more than that. It's not just sexual intimacy. It's the idea here of complete oneness. One in heart. One in mind. You begin to think and, and believe the same way mentally. One in faith, you, you share the same belief system. And when you don't, it causes problems, right? But the idea is that you're supposed to be one in faith, one in purpose, one in labors. And so you join yourself to your spouse and you become one flesh. It's through this one flesh union that a husband and wife are to build their life and solidify a legacy. And God loves marriage. In fact, it's the very picture that he paints of his own relationship to his covenant people. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 5 with me this morning. Ephesians chapter 5. Now, I can't tell you how many times I've taught on this, read this. I use this text in premarital counseling, postmarital counseling, all the time. This is probably the, the, the most popular New Testament passage about marriage. And I think so because it consists of Paul's abbreviated instructions for husbands and wives as they consider their own marriage as in the realm of where God has, uh, has designed them to worship him the most. Ephesians chapter 5. Now we're jumping right into the middle of a narrative here of a, of a whole line of arguments and Paul's teaching on unity within the church and submission to the Lord and so on and so forth. But he drops us in in verse 22 here. Husbands and wives. He says, wives... Be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. And as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to also love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. And then look at verse 31. He quotes here the same verse as Jesus does. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his wife, his own wife, as, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. And so in this passage, Paul is making a reference to this great mystery. And we know that this great mystery here in verse 32 is referencing Jesus Christ and the church. And so we are in a spiritual, marital relationship with God. And I think a lot of men struggle with this. Christian men struggle to think about us being the wife and Christ being the husband. But you have to see what this really is. He's likening the marital relationship to that kind of intimacy and closeness and oneness of having our relationship to God. It's a similar, it's a simile. It's meant to be a picture of what that relationship looks like. But the mystery is made a little clearer here because we all, we should all, understand what marriage looks like. Marriage is such a common institution. Not common meaning lowly, but common meaning so many people are married. We see this repeated over and over again. And so the, the image between marital relationship and God and his people is made much more clear. The husband, the one husband representing Christ, is married to and one flesh with one wife, which represents the church. There's not two Christs that are married. There's not two churches. There is one Christ one church, and we are joined to him. That's the design. That is the sacred relationship, and it's meant to be honored and preserved. Furthermore, God 
wants marriages to work. I want to say that again. God wants your marriage to work. He truly does. He wants husbands to love their wives, to provide for them, to nourish and cherish them, to protect them, to cleanse and sanctify their wives, to minister and to care. And when a husband does this every day until death, God is honored. God loves when men love their wives. And on the other hand, the, God, the Lord wants the wives to honor and respect their husbands too, to aid and to help him, to submit and to yield to him, to love and care for him, to win his heart by her own character, to satisfy and sustain him. And when a wife does this, God is honored. Remember, we are yoked together, we're glued together in love and in unity and in godliness. And this is why Jesus finishes his response to the Pharisees in Matthew 19, 6 with this statement. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. This notion of trying to separate and remove and tear apart a one flesh union, it's akin to mutilating or amputating a body part. You know, we see even in, in medical, medical circles even today, when we have twins that are born conjoined, how serious are those surgeries that try to separate them? And is it possible to separate conjoined twins who share a heart? Not that I'm aware of. One will eventually pass away, and actually both will pass away, which is a very sad thing. But if that's what we see even in the scientific or bodily realm, how much more so for a husband and a wife who are bound together as one flesh and share a heart? So this idea of tearing them apart, but Jesus isn't saying you can't do it. He's not saying it, you, it's impossible. He's, rather, he's saying don't do it. He's saying let no man separate. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more. And so, but the question then is, which position does he take? Is it Shammai or is it Hillel? The answer is neither. Instead, he takes the Malachi position. What is the Malachi position? It's the position that says that God loves marriage. God loves marriage. And because of this, Malachi 2.16 says he hates divorce. He hates divorce. Why? Well, because divorce is the destruction of the one flesh union. A union that God designed to be good. And so when the Pharisees ask him, what do you think of any cause divorce? His answer is, what do you think of the one flesh union? See, by focusing on the provisions of divorce from Deuteronomy 24.1, the Pharisees, they're missing the greater argument painted by Scripture. They're missing the point. The question should not have been, what does it take for us to obtain a divorce? Their question should have been, what does it take to maintain a faithful marriage? That should be the focus. And I'll tell you, I've read books on marriage and divorce and remarriage and debates about divorce, and we talk so much about divorce, and we do have to answer those questions. And by God's grace, over the next several weeks, we will try to bring some clarity to those questions. But if our starting point is let's talk about divorce. We're missing the point altogether. That is not God's intention for us to lock ourselves into this debate over, well, what's, what's allowable? How, how do we get out of this and divorce our spouse? Rather, we should be focused in our hearts on, all right, how do I make my marriage work? How do I be a better husband? How do I be a better wife? How do I honor God in the, the marriage that he has given to me? And we know no marriage is perfect. Some are stronger and more joyful than others. But no marriage is perfect. Why? Well, because you got two sinners who are stuck together. You think you were sinful before? Get married. You realize how sinful you really are, right? I mean, I'm kind of being funny, but the point is that doesn't God bring a spouse, a godly spouse, to bring them as a sanctifying influence? There are blind spots that I have that my wife sees, and boy, does she see them. And I see hers as well. And it's supposed to be that way. We're supposed to sharpen and encourage and enhance and bring out the best in each other, right? 
Is it so we can have this rock solid marriage in and of itself? For Christians, no. The goal is to glorify Christ in the marriage. That's what Ephesians 5.21 says. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So God wants these marriages to work so the whole world will see that this marital relationship which reflects the divine and church relationship, we gotta show what that's supposed to look like. And so when Christian husbands love their Christian wives, the world says, that's very interesting. And you can say, well, that's actually how Christ loves his church and how the church submits to Christ and how that is a loving union and God is glorified. Of course, the Pharisees pressed the question in verse 7. Well, yeah, that we know all that. We've read Genesis. But doesn't God permit divorce? And here's where they're going to try to hang him. And as we're going to see, Jesus will affirm, yes, God does permit divorce under certain circumstances. But divorce, again, is not the focus. Divorce is a merciful provision in light of the hardness of of the sinful heart. But marriage is God's gracious purpose for men and women. And here's the thing, only hard-hearted people desire divorce. But God-honoring people desire faithfulness in marriage. They want their marriage to work. And I've, I've done Marriage counseling, counseling for family or couples that had been on the very verge, on the very end of it. And there have been times when, it's a lot of times when it comes to immorality, it's usually the wife who's sitting in my office crying. And I've had women who sit there and say, I know I have grounds, but I don't want to. I want my marriage to work. I want them to repent. I want to be restored. Even though their trust has been completely destroyed. God honoring people desire for godly marriage. We want this to work. We really do. But then the question persists, what happens if sinfulness destroys a marriage and severs the one flesh union? Well, we're going to start talking about that next time and by God's grace to bring some clarity and understanding for that issue. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we come to these texts and, and Lord, these are challenging, not because they're biblically hard to understand, but because the implications are so, so personal, so serious, so intense. And Lord, even today, we're in a culture that is just fever pitched over this issue of marriage and divorce and remarriage. Lord, people get so frustrated and so angry and just out of their minds when you even question this issue. Those outside the church, those even inside the church. And so, Lord, my desire pastorally, and I know that our desire is your body, your bride, is to understand what you desire for marriage. And so, Lord, I pray that as we study and grow in our understanding, that you would convict us and comfort us and illuminate our minds. And, Lord, I pray that even as we talk about divorce and remarriage, that it would serve as an exciting force to motivate us to work even harder in our existing marriages, that we would be a a people committed to faithfulness and not those who are seeking divorce. But Lord, we're, we're, we have the crosshairs on our back right now from culture. Father, they hate us because we dare to say that two men or two women don't belong together. We dare to say that it's one man and one woman for life. We dare to say that. But Lord, I pray that even as we promote and share this biblical view, that you would give us confidence in Christ, that even though people will hate us for this view, that we have nothing to apologize for. Because not only do we see that this model and design of marriage is good and right in a functional society, but this understanding of what your design is, is what you want to see. You are honored by biblical marriage. 
And so, Lord, help us not to be afraid of that. Help us to embrace that with courage and with love and even with tenderness, especially those who are against us in this view. We would be gracious to present this and and demonstrate why this is so important. And so, Lord, I pray, because an unbelieving world rejects all this. And as we talk about these issues of marriage and divorce, O Lord, I pray that you would also impress on our hearts and on our mouths and on our tongues what separates these two worlds. And what separates these two worlds is the issue of salvation. That what we have is not some moral superiority that's inherent to us as individuals, but what we have is a saving gospel. A gospel that tells us the news that yes, we are sinful people, And yes, by nature, we are all wretched. But Jesus Christ, who is the husband of this spiritual relationship, Jesus Christ, the sovereign one, the holy one, the righteous one, came and gave up his life and died for his bride, the church. That he died on the cross to pay for our sins. That all of our sinfulness was put to death on him. And then when he was raised the third day from the grave, all of us who believe and trust in him and have repented of our sins have new life in Christ. Lord, that is our most sacred gospel and the message that we should start with. Lord, let us not fight always about divorce, but help us to contend for the gospel, which then has implications for all things. Let us always be gospel people Lord, you, in your mercy and love, save sinners. And Lord, you have saved the worst of sinners, namely, all of us. And by our, by our humility to humble ourselves before you, by repentance, by faith, we trust in your work on the cross. We love you, O Lord. And we submit everything that we have, our lives, our marriages, our families, we submit everything to you because you are the sovereign Lord. Help us, Lord, to understand and believe and trust you in all these things. In Jesus' name, amen.